Uh, let's dive in. Um, okay, so please feel free at any point to jump in and you know uh, and contribute. <laughs> Don't let me be talking because like this is the my first encounter with this stuff. So um, the chapter nine is basically about um, dealing with few you know levels, which basically uh, saying that uh, when we gonna train our model, sometimes we don't have data or we have a few and annotating more data is not feasible, right? Um, because uh, you cannot um, uh, annotate uh, data for every domain. Um, some domain you don't have expertise, you need to look for other people. So the solutions to this few or no data is zero shot or few shot learning. And these are the general way. And in fact, the performance of system depend on the, you know, uh, domain we are using. So um, this is the a quick, um, you know, tree that explain how you're gonna select what are you gonna do. So if you have level data, then you basically move to do zero shot learning. Um, I mean, if you don't have level data, you just jump to do zero shot if you don't have any level data. But if you have um, some level data, and those level data are quite large. Um, for example, I think how many large it is. So for example, if I have 1000 levels, um, yeah, 1000 levels, um, annotated level can do uh, well. Um, I think you can fine tune a model. Um, uh, a few, if you have a few, um, you know, you have many a level data, then you can, you know, do domain adaptation to fine tune the model, um, you know, to the models. Uh, or if you don't have a level data, you can do a few short learning or embedded lookup. So this is basically what this chapter is all about. But uh, what I'm not sure is um, now when they say here, how many levels do you have? You're gonna fine tune. So what this question is, how many? So to me, I think how many do we can we say like? One thousand is enough to find levels. And for example, if you want to do sentiment analysis, you have one thousand level sentences, um, positive, negative, something like that. Is it enough to find two model, or is there any literature? I'm not sure. Like what defines what is a lot or few? Anybody knows this um, or something like that? I mean, I think it depends on the model and the task. Okay. Right. So, for example. It's a bit of an odd example, but for fine using OpenAI GPT three fine tuning, you only need it's very different than a BERT, you know, an encoder site. You only need a couple hundred. That's it. Mm -hmm. But for a a BERT based, you know, like a uh, encoder, and you're doing a classification problem for a small number of classes, mm -hmm. uh, again, a few hundred might get you somewhere. A few thousand may be really all you need. That's what I. Off, that's what I think. I don't know. Maybe I'm off. Right now. So what do you guys think? Okay, cool. All right. So um, it depends uh, what you said. Uh, depends. On yeah, and if you're pre-training, if you're pre-training your model, right, from mm -hmm. scratch, you may need millions of documents. Ah, no, no, no. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> but pre-training, pre actually, <laughs> I take it back. Pre-training, though, you don't need labels, right? It's oh, self-supervised. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so you don't need level. Irrelevant, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So um, what I take away is like, um, it depends on the task and yeah. So, okay. So um, so what this chapter is trying to use is trying to use a data set um, from GitHub uh, called Git, Building a GitHub Issue Tracker, tracker and Tagger. So what we can see here is like a title of an issue, the description, you know, the tag, you know. So this tag has many levels, right? Deep speed, model, you know, working program. So what they are intended to do is basically grab this text and now predict the levels, um, what this is all about. Um, something related to this. So this is um, given a title and description, title and description predict one or more levels. So we can see like given this title and this predicts one or more. So this is kind of multi uh, level classification. So this is gonna be using this data set up to the end of the book, I mean, chapter. So they now grab this data set here and now because they already have it, now um, uh, uh, we have the data set here and we can see this is the data set. And now these are some of the you know columns we can see the um, URL and stuff like that. Um, 
yeah <clears throat> and now here the you know um change it here we can see here the, where we have the levels here so this is a column we want to uh, interested in to do the predictions which will have the levels attack um yeah so what they do here is like uh, they put all the um, stuff um in uh, levels here and we can see here now this is somehow kind of uh levels for issue so here for issue so what they do they just start preparing the data set so here they are not just you know for issue zero um uh for those that are not level i think they don't have level uh, zero you know this show that the majority of issue have zero over level so uh from the gate of repository because we can see this so um here what they said is uh, okay so here um some of them are not you know we can discard them let's take uh, maybe top 10 i think so here they take top 10 and we can see like um um, uh, um we can see okay how many levels we have 65 yeah um so this is also a level data um, i mean imbalanced data set we can see like we have many levels uh they are not well balanced um they keep doing going um uh, okay, so here, like um, they have now. Let's look at the distribution of the new levels that they pick. Um, we can see this is the distribution of the levels they have. Um, yeah, so here we have um those levels that are all level and those that are level. So the what they mean is they will use these um all levels at the later in the chapter of the book to do like uh, somehow kind of domain adaptation because we need more data to do domain adaptation. And here they will use I think the level um you know tags to do um fine tuning so here we have small couple of sample we can see like 441 so the question i was asking like how many sample do we need to uh, basically do um you know uh, fine tuning so we here can see here level i think they have these and all levels they have these um yeah so this is an example i think for one of this um we can see the title you know the body, you know, and the level is new model. Um, this is the level. Uh, they remove some duplicate from the data set. You can see that. And now here they look at the distribution of the text in the um, data. So we can see here basically like a, this is somehow kind of long tail. Um, you see, um, it's uh, of course we know that uh, some of them that are zero from here uh, that are on level. Uh, we saw that they are a level which is zero. That's why they have this, you know, uh, this. So um, we can see here also the last is 500. So they were talking about, you know, uh, given most transfers so have contests as of one for 512. Truncating handle of long issue is not likely going to affect. So they are not going, you know, remember we do truncation of our. So, but here we can see here. So they're going to, I think, leave it without um, truncating. So that's um, that. And creating training set. Um, so they want to create training set from the data set. They use um, scikit learn. Um, uh, what do they call um, uh, scikit scikit learn multi level whatsoever? And here they create binary there. And now they use um, SK, um, not scikit learn, SK multi learn, multi learn to just do division of your uh, train, val, and test set um, into three classes. Here they, we can see we have. Uh, DF train, DF um, test, and um, uh, DF validation set. So here they basically divide the data into train, test, and dev. Um, uh, I wasn't. Um, I mean, it is only through this book that I know. Like, um, um, there is this uh, multi. Um, this what is it called? Um, this iterative train um, from this. Uh, library i don't know it um so um before i that's not how i do like division of train test and dev um but uh yeah and finally they just put these um you know into uh data set dictionary so that it can be used you know for uh, tokenizer and also they go on further to create uh, training slices um uh, what does that mean is um, now, of course, we divide our data set in the train and case and dev. We can go and train model, right? But what they say, like, um, um, uh, they want to basically, uh, okay, the clearing instead consists of only 220. Um, we can see, like, basically, we already have, um, we can see the whole data set here. We can see is how many? 441. 
So the training set here we can see like is 220 and um, it's be it's gonna be challenging for you know training the model even fine tuning. But what they wanna train, um, what they wanna try to see is like, okay, let's not even train on um, fine tune on 220. Let's fine tune on some small subtraction, maybe um, uh, let's say nine, 50, um, 100, 150 to see how the performance of the model will work given this kind of um, you know uh, uh, available number of training sample. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll start with only a sample per level and build up. Um, yeah, so this is this is uh, the splitting trend split trend slice. I mean, so this is what they have, and this is the trend slice. So this is the, yeah, we have eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, and two. So this is how they are going to basically train with these samples of uh, um, target. Um, so, uh, okay. So anyone want to add something uh, or I miss something? Okay, so um, so before we go into training any you know um, uh, transformer based model when working with um, NLP project or anything project, I think it's good to build um, you know uh, a baseline performance, and uh, they're gonna use naive base um, classifier to build a baseline performance. And they made mention why baseline is important is like when you build and by and by um, I mean. Uh, uh, maybe even like uh, rules or any uh, classical machine learning model and you get like accuracy, a good model give you 98. So you don't need to use transformer, right? Um, because uh, transformer, transformer are not always in any circumstances data uh, in some situation, I believe. Um, so that's what they are using. So you can just use your uh, classical ML but also they can serve as a baseline where you can see like if your um, classical ML give you uh, 80, um, 60 or 80 percent and you are transformer based model give you it, then you can, you know, come back and, you know, tune or develop your model to see that it gives you a better performance. So that's what they are doing here. So they want to basically train in a base classifier. And here um, the... Uh, um, train an a based class pair uh, using um, the same uh, these uh, multi SK multi LAN whatsoever it is, and now uh, um, we uh, basically have the um, two like, um, uh, evaluation metrics, macro score and micro score. Um, now uh, we can see. Uh, um okay the float their performance of using these stuff so we can see like this is nearby performance uh micro f1 score and macro f1 score which we would normally knows how to do this from sk lab so we can see like um the um f1 score um started from number of training sample we have eight you can see like um this is the accuracy but 16 um but Look at 32. And now, of course, when we added more, the performance increased. Um, so we can see here, like, you know, um, we have eight is this, but when we have 16, the performance drops. Um, so what will be like the possible explanation, do you think? Um uh, why this um Uh, okay, this is it. Uh, with so few examples to turn on, the result is slightly noisy since each slice can have different class distribution. Um, okay. So anyone wants to uh, um, maybe have an idea why, what we can we say here, why uh, this has the performance drop while we have more? And also, this is uh, macro F1. Uh, so the we have micro, we have macro. So macro deals all the levels equally but micro deals with the class with higher um you know uh with the higher instances um, give it more uh, stuff so um now we build a baseline performance using a base um so let's look at the um transformer based models so um we will see the first one which is zero shot classification um 
also the zero shot classification uh, is basically is to make use of pre-trained model with any additional fine tuning on your specific corpus. So no any fine tuning, just um, you know, make prediction, just take pre-trained model uh, and do that. Now, so how does this um, works? So um, the uh, basically in started explaining that uh, we all know about uh, uh, pre-trained predict mass token in text of um, this language. We all know we saw this. And uh, now, to successfully predict emission token, the model need to be aware of the context. Uh, we we'll see what this means. Uh, given uh, a, a, a max uh, to predict, so you need a context. So, um, for example, here, this section was about the topic. Uh, this section was about the topic. So now you put this mass and trying to predict this. So this is the idea we're going to use um, to do uh, zero shot. So this given um, a toy example, they said, suppose you have two children and one of them likes movie with cars while other enjoys movie with animals. So they need something to uh, movie with car and someone movie with animals. So you want to predict two classes, more, uh, whether the movie is animal or with car. Um, so what we're gonna do is basically we instantiate uh, uh, maybe BART, uh, which is a, a BART based model using film max here. And now what we can do is like, we gonna give um, prompt and you know uh, text to predict. Um, so here is a simple text uh, here, uh, which is the main character of the movie is this. And now this is the prompt we're gonna give and try to predict what is it. So the movie is about, um, so this is a max here. And now here we can see, uh, we combine this and the prompt because you remember here we all know that uh, uh, the model need to be aware of the topic in context, right? So you can see putting them here, uh, the question, the movie is about, this is the context, the context we have animals here, which, you know, now we build the pipeline and we can see like uh, the tokens gives animals um, higher, um, you know, uh, uh, score, you can see that, and lions, you know, all this stuff. Uh, so we can see the models works well. Um, at this point in time, we can say like, yeah, we did fine tune our bad model. We just, you know, use this uh, stuff, which is um, the zero shot. Um, but also um, what we can do is like, uh, we can basically um, add, uh, uh, I mean, we can give some kind of a, uh, uh, <clears throat> target to predict on. So uh, here, the same thing with this pipeline, but here we can see we have discussion prop and we can give the target to predict which is which. Um, so while the querying here, so we can see here, given this, it can predict um, uh, this, the token is uh, animals and with this. And so uh, we can see like um, uh, basically uh, this, works well without any fine tuning. Uh, but we can also basically uh, uh, ask this to give us uh, the probability uh, for that as well. Um, uh, okay, the predictable for the token is much smaller than animal. Let's see if this works for description closer to the cast. So here they give an example description that is closer to the cast. Also, you know, you can see the cast works, uh, has a beta score also here for the animal because so, we can see here without doing any fine tuning, um, you know, just doing the model as is, it, it makes uh, a good, um, yeah. Uh, so the key idea of many efforts is to find a way to uh, adapt pre model to learn a task. So I think this is basically one of the way to do a zero shot using this idea of uh, mass language model. Uh, anyone wants to add something that I miss? Okay, so um, the, uh, another idea they talk about is uh, using Max language model for classification is a nice trick, but we can do better. So um, the problem is the BART based, for example, language, um, um, language, Max language model uh, problem here we use is not trend, uh, it's not like a classification based problem. So if we can, you know, use um, zero short on classification, something that is trend for classification 
base problem, it will have a bit of performance. So this is what this says. Um, there is um, a, 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 a task called um, test entailment that could this build. So what this is, um, the test entailment does is that given like um, given three things, uh, premise, premise and hypothesis, um, you predict the level. So for example here, the house was recently built, the house is new. We can see like here, this is entailment, right? Because this is given a premise, this given hypothesis. But what about this? She find the joke hilarious. She find the joke is not funny at all. So this is contradiction. Um, his favorite color is blue. He's not heavy black. So you can see this and this, they are not even kind of, you know, in the same thing. So this is neutral. So the what they are saying is that we can model our problem as um, entailment. So we give the text, um, uh, uh, we give the model something like this as premise. Um, uh, the entailment is assigned when uh, 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 we give the model these and try to see whether if the hypothesis, what the hypothesis is, and now we can have the level. So that's what they want to apply here. Yeah, so you can see now it turns out that we can hijack model train on uh, MNLI. So we have different kind of data set for, um, you know, doing this uh, entailment. One of them is multi NLI corpus, natural language um, NLI corpus. What is it? Natural language, what is NLI? <laughs> uh, and cross-lingual NLI corpus. Hmm. I, I think these are the two data sets uh, uh, which they have used here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what does what is the meaning of NLI? NLI. Inference. Natural language inference. Ah, okay, okay. Inference. Okay, natural language inference. Okay. So, yeah. So, we're going to use the, this data set here. Uh, so this is how the where we said uh, they explain how we can do the internment school. Uh, mm. Okay, so this is it. The internment school then tell us how likely that the premise is to be about the period. We can run this by any number of class questions. So this is it. Um, we try to give this and see whether the hypothesis is entailment or whether it's contradiction and neutral. So let's look at what they do here. We um, pass the, uh, you know, we can use the uh, MNLI, uh, National Language Inference uh, pipeline here. Uh, we import here this one. Uh, we run this and create the pipeline here and text um, a sample. Uh, the first stop, and now we can see here, this is uh, basically, uh, we have three uh, dictionary here, we can see this is level uh, text, and now we want to give this text to make prediction, and here this is the text within the pipeline, and we want to predict all level, and we want to do multi-level through. Um, so we can see now here after fit in the pipeline, we can basically try to see what is a prediction all about. So given uh, this, uh, uh, given uh, uh, this text, which is this one that we put in the pipeline and now try to see the prediction, the level and scores and put them together here. And now we can see like uh, it predict the, um, the level for this one. We know that the level is, uh, what is the level? If we look at it, the level is new model. Yeah, new model. So here is what they have, um, new model with higher accuracy. So this is basically um, how uh, this works. Um, anyone wants to ask something? And we can basically um, write a function that put a single example through zero shot pipeline and then scale it. So here, basically what they wanna do is write for a simple example one here, we can see that, and now take the uh, predictor level as we saw here, take the predictor score, because here this one here, we can see the score, the level, and now they now uh, you know, map them to uh, 
uh, you know, do it uh, into the whole validation stuff. And um, yeah, so that's uh, this. So, but the idea they discuss after this is now that we have our score, the next step is to determine which of the levels should be assigned to each example. And they talk about that two different ways using a threshold. And we define a threshold and select all levels above those threshold, or we pick a top K level with K nearest, um, K high score. And they discuss this, and it turns out that at the end, we can see that uh, uh, the top one uh, result, uh, uh, they discuss gives beta performance. And uh, they just took, um, yeah, since the top one method performed best, let's use it to compare zero shot classification and get nine best. So, what they are saying is like these method, two approaches they want to use, they try them here uh, um, and now find out like the top key approach works best. And now they say, okay, let's try using this using naive base, uh, using this approach. And now they train. A, now we already trained in a base, but we want to select the top K. And now here we do that. And now we have um, naive base um, uh, performance as well. So here we can see uh, we have the performance here of uh, naive base here. We have the performance of zero shot. Um, we can see here the naive base start learning um, very worse score, um, but uh, we can see zero shot like. Um, so what this instance is, so we have zero shot, like it's not even like, you know, uh, changing, we have, uh, I don't know what to say. So um, we can see here with few 50 level samples um, with less than 50, um, we can see like, uh, because from here, yeah, from here all down here, down here we can see like a naive base is actually not doing well um but we can see like um the zero shot even with eight samples is doing but I, I i who can explain why like um the zero shot even with all the samples here we can see like it's still constant what is happening here um Um, we can see the result of the micro F1 score tells that the pipeline performs well on the frequent classes. Yeah, so I'm not sure like why do we have for the zero shot, um, we can see like the F1 score is constant here. Um, but for the naive base, we can see yes, uh, as expected. Um, uh, uh, Maybe okay. it does not depend upon the number of training samples. Mm, okay. There is no training whatsoever with zero shot. Yeah, that's the zero and zero shot. Okay, so ah, okay, but naive base we are training it, right? Yes. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Just uh, do bag of words and the more yes, words yes. you have. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um. Okay, so um, let us now turn to the gym where we have field. So this is basically. Um, uh, working through um, the uh, no level at all. And we can see like in this case, um, so naive base actually, um, you know, performs uh, better if we have more, um, you know, samples, yeah, right. Um, but um, if we don't have more samples, zero shot, like um, they are just few, then we can just go for zero shot. But what about this uh, macro F1? So the macro F1 we can see here is worst in the sense that uh, because this is micro uh, F1, but I think the beta score uh, scoring function, I mean, uh, uh, the beta, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, evaluation metric here will be macro F1 score. So let's assume like I'm doing a classification with imbalance data. And like example, I have 100 positive and we have like a 10 negative. So we will, we will basically, I think, prefer to use macro F1, right? Is that correct? Correct uh, me if I'm wrong. Um, so this means that um, 
the, the reason why I'm asking is like um here we are still giving micro F1 and macro F1, and we can see like using micro F1, this one performs better, right? But using macro F1, like the models in all situation, it was than the zero shot. So micro F1, as I said earlier, like it gives um better, it gives more wide weight, I think, to frequent classes. So I don't know. Okay. Yeah, the macro, I kind of understand that the macro is doing each, in, it's giving you a measure for each individual label, I think. Yeah. It gives and then it's averaging those up or something. Mm -hmm. Right. So then the size of the classes are irrelevant. Yeah, the it's more it's more accurate though, right? Like if yes, you're actually exactly. looking at what if you actually go to a topic and see how accurate the results are, mm -hmm. like I think that macro is what is much more intuitive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the macro take each level has equal, um, what do yes. you call it? Yeah, it's like you're assigning you're assigning your precision recall and your F one to each class individually, as if it's mm -hmm. a single class problem. Yeah, and then I, okay. I don't know if they're averaging them up or what they're doing, but because with mm -hmm. the with the micro, if you you might go into one class that's a big class, maybe it's highly accurate. But you may go to another class and the accuracy is way like F one is way way low. So yeah, yeah. Okay, so now we have seen like um you know working with no levels and we saw like uh, it performs good and comparing with neighbors. So let's go to the another one, um working with a few levels. Um so. Um, mostly we have few levels associated in some situation, as they said. Um, now, what we mean here is that um, we can use different kind of techniques um, if you have few levels to, you know, do a better training than zero shot. So the first one is data argumentation using embedded lookup, fine tuning the linear to transformer and in context and a few short learning with prompt. So let's look at the first one, which is data argumentation. So I'm um, given a few levels. Um, I want to do sentiment classification. For example, I have like a um, 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 hundred sample of, of 50. Um, we can use data argumentation, which is obviously used in, you know, vision, but uh, now is being used in text class, in text, right? But what they say is like, um, it's more there is some issue with um uh, in text data augmentation than the vision in the sense that it um you know it is tricky uh, given this example a uh, plant uh, elephant heavier than mice and changing this one here it gives different answers but in computer vision given like um uh, given like a um, cat and now you rotate the cat like this it gives you the same cat right there is no <laughs> different answer right so it's still the same thing. So data argumentation in vision is makes, uh, you know, it's, uh, but also in, um, uh, in text, in data also there are, you know, many, many uh, ways now that you can do that. So the two ways that they said here, uh, you can do data argumentation for text is back translation and token by, uh, what, how do you pronounce this guy? Token? Uh, perturbations. Motivations, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Token motivations, right? So back translation. So back translation. If I want to create more data, um, for example, I have um, you know, few sentences level in you know English, and I want to bootstrap to get more data. So what I can do is like I will translate this English from um these level sentences maybe to French. When I translate them to French, now. I back translate from that translated sentences to uh, back translate it to English. That that kind of translation may create some kind of variety in the text, but it's still the same text. But because of you do translation, it may look somehow different, but they convey the same meaning. That's back translation. Um, to convert by perturbation, perturbation given a text. Um, this one is basically like. Um, substitution of tokens by another sample so you can do like replace talk synonym replacement word insertion and swap and deletion um so this is an example of uh, data augmentation the uh, for example insertion swap delete whatsoever you can see this is um, the original 
And now you can see all these uh, sample that I do replace. So even if you kill me, so you can see defeat me, uh, replace with, you know, kill me, others will prove uh, rise to it. So something like that. Um, so uh, now how can we do back translation? Um, we can basically use translation model, right? M to M 100 uh, or like libraries such as NLP, uh, ARG, uh, uh, can provide token for version. So for um, this uh, back translation, you can use this. And for um, this token for version, you can use this um, library. So this is an example of the uh, NLP ARG library um, where you can do like given this, it has different kind of, you know, synonyms, word embeddings, contextual word embedding, you know, all this one, you can specify which one you want to do the for version. Um, so let's look at how we can do that. Um, so here you can see, basically we uh, use this, you know, this stuff, uh, NLP, this guy, and this, and this, and this, so for word and for car, and, you know, for sentences, so you can have different kind of uh, this version. Um, so what is it? Okay, for flow, and also you can have for flow as well. Um, this is an example we can see like the, they can train, like given an example here, even if you repeat me, even if you kill me, this is the example I showed here, this one, uh, this one. So this is the code that could, uh, you know, that prefer that, um, which I already show. Um, but we're gonna use, um, you know, contextual word embedding that brings the word embedding for, you know, because we are talking about the synonyms and whatsoever. And so the word embedding will basically um, contain all those stuff. So for us to use in, um, for, to use in our transformer based model, we're going to use contextual word embedding augmenter uh, here uh, uh, to leverage the word embedding of this part. So here, this is it. Uh, here we can see now contextual word this, and now we provide the uh, model. And you know, what action do we want to do is we want to do substitution. Remember, we have different kind of action, right? Um, you can do um, replace what inside and whatsoever. So this one here, when you define your um, augmenter, you need to uh, provide the kind of stuff you want to do. And we can see like uh, we have transformers are the most popular toys, but here we have transformers, right? So we can see give, this give us a new version of transformer and this, uh, you know, it, it just changes uh, something. So this is something that uh, um, uh, these guys can do. Um, so we can wrap this argumentation in a simple function. So here, I think they wrap it in a single function here called text argument text. Um, they want to do it. Now we pass this to map function. So here, um, maybe what they do. Oh, okay. <laughs> My stuff finished running at the year. Uh, so now we pass this function to the map method. We can generate any number of example. Okay. So here we can see that they can use this to train the slides we already saw previously. And now um, after the training here, they plot the performance of these, um, you know, name base for us um, argumentation. So here they use the name base that- we, I have a uh, question here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, how much time did you take to uh, train this train slice uh, cell? Ah. <laughs> Uh -huh. It takes it takes forever. I don't know what happened. Like um, that, and you can see I did. I was not even able, able to run anything be, beyond this. And this is what happened. I stopped here, so I was not even you know to have an answer. You can see that's what happened. I didn't even know because before I, I started looking at the code today morning, and mm -hmm. I started running this. I think since I click on it since maybe ten or you know um. I don't know, but it was just working. So I was waiting it for it to finish, but um, it, it seems um not finished. So I just move on, just trying to go through because I didn't run anything below this, and you can see it even fell. So what what happened from here on it? Yeah, it takes a lot of time. I think so. It's a culmination of uh the first uh uh training uh. It, it, uh, the uh, training set took uh, four point six minutes. I yeah, four uh, uh, forty 
eight in your case. The second training set took eight thirty eight minutes thirty one seconds. Mm -hmm. The third took sixteen zero uh, six. So that's the culmination of I don't know uh, how they are trying here, uh, specifically with the count vectorization. So I was a bit curious as to why it takes so much of time to mm -hmm. vectorize it and uh, then take the binary uh, binary uh, um, um, relevance of this mm -hmm. in such a way that it uh, the fitting is so much uh, uh, yeah. cumulative. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, what do you think that takes this? Because this is not like, you know, training transformer, but it's basically like, what do you think that takes this much time while doing this split, doing this stuff? I don't know what. Yeah, I'm on the same, same boat. Maybe this we can ask the authors. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you finish running this one? No, uh, I tried. I started in the afternoon, but yeah, I still haven't uh, finished it. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> others have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. So yeah, so yeah, I, so obviously me too. This is where I stop, but uh, let's keep going because this, um, there is this notebook um, uh, already for the book, so <laughs> you can just go through it. So here we can see nave base for the argumentation. We can see here like. Uh, this is the performance. Um, so we can tell that, um, you know, um, naive bees um, plus the augmentation now gives upper performance because we do some kind of data augmentation. Also here, use a macro F1, it gives beta performance. So definitely we can see that um, the uh, data augmentation here um, improved F1 score of the naive base cluster around five points, uh, and it overtake the zero shot pipeline for the macro scores once we have around 170 training samples so yeah so when we have around 170 uh okay is it true 120 sample uh, i think this is not correct right or maybe maybe uh yeah Okay, so this is um, basically um, data argumentation using, um, you know, perturbation over saver. Um, but there is another one which is using embedding as lookup table. So, um, yeah, anyone wants to add something before we move on to the next one? Okay, Darin, you want to add something? <laughs> Okay, so um, we can see here um, using embedding as a lookup. So this is also a data argumentation, um, but uh, it's going to use um, uh, maybe embeddings. So as we all know, that large language models um, such as GPT, uh, they have, uh, you know, uh, excellent at solving tasks with limited data. And uh, for this reason, the embedding of large language model can be used to develop a semantic search engine similar to, you know, so since um, language model uh, like GPT-3, uh, they do a good job so we can utilize their word embeddings, uh, their embeddings to do some stuff. So uh, how can we do this embedding to create like a data augmentation? Three steps. Um, we can create a test classifier after the open API classification endpoint using three steps. Number one, use a language model to embed all the level text. So use the language model such as GPT-2 or GPT-3 and all your text that you have that you wanna do the embeddings, um, all, um, you know, uh, use the language model to embed them. And then the second one, perform a nearest neighbor search over the storage embedding. You find, you use the nearest neighbor to find which embeddings they are. Uh, further and now you aggregate the levels of the nearest neighbor. So this is the idea they want to uh, say in. So here we can see like uh, we have, um, you know, use a language model to embed all the levels. So we use a language model here to embed this level. So you, this is our embeddings, for example. This is my understanding. You can correct them. This is our embeddings here uh, using the language model. So for a nearest neighbor search uh, over the stored embedding. Um, so uh, 
they talk about you can use nearest neighbor you can specify how many number you want to do so you can see like uh, if we want to use you can see this embedding they are somehow closer this one you know uh, this red whatsoever the color this color you know so you can specify the nearest neighbor how you know you're gonna do like you know um uh search and over the story embedding and aggregate the level of the nearest neighbor of prediction then uh, you, you do finally aggregate the level so these are the three steps you can do uh, something um so here they talk about like uh, since gpt3 is only available through open api we'll use gpt2 specifically we use the variant um you know what's turned on python code which hopefully captured it some noises uh, of IG to issue. So uh, they used a variant that was trained on, you know, Python code, so that because our problem here is on coding, so it would be good. So yeah. Um, so we have here, we initially, we have our model here. And now here we have two functions. We have what we call min pooling, and now we have what you call embed test, right? So one thing they explain in the book is that, uh, one problem that uh, deal with uh, uh, a transformer model like GPT-2 will actually return one embedding vector per token. So given one token, they will give one embedding for that. So given the sentence I look like this, we can expect several embedding vectors for one of each tag. So using GPT-2, so for embedding for this and this. But what we really want is a single embedding vector. So we want to really embed in vector for all these ones, right? Uh, for the whole sentences uh, or GitHub issue in our application. Um, to deal with this, we use a technical um, simplest uh, pooling to abridge the inbuilding. So this is mean pooling, basically taking, I think, the mean from the name, which called mean pooling. So this, they implemented the, uh, the, uh, the function to do the mean pooling to return a single embedding um, here. And also now finally um, wrap, uh, do the embed everything here after you have uh, the, uh, after you have the, uh, the uh, min, embed, min pooling for each, uh, for each text. So you embed everything here. And you can see here, like they call the min embedding here that we define here um, to each uh, stuff. So um, I, I didn't run this because that's what happened. Uh, so now that we can get embedding for each split, um, uh, remember uh, we uh, the first step here is use the language model to embed all text, right? So here, uh, um, I don't understand what this means. Uh, uh, Anyway, um, um mm -hmm. it's embedding. That's I think that's where the embedding is taking place. Uh, that's a function, right? You're mapping a function, embed text. Oh, oh, okay, 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 okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So no, what about this one? Uh they talk about this one that uh the, uh that something GPT-2 model doesn't have a padding token, and therefore we need to add one before we can get embedding in a batch fashion as implemented in the precision code. Uh, we just recycle end of string token for this purpose. So uh, what do anybody know? These? Oh, the, yeah, the, the padding makes everything the same length. Like each uh, sequence has to be the okay. same length. So some oh, of the okay. sentences are shorter than others. Yeah. Uh, okay, I get it. Okay, gotcha. Um, so cool. here, yeah. Thank you. So here we can see like we do the embedding. So that's the first step we showed here. Um, now that we have all the embeddings, we need to set the system to search for them. We could write a function to calculate, see the cosine similarity between the text and uh, using the embedding. Alternatively, there is a built-in function using the call it a face index in, uh, you know, that is available, I think, is it? Yeah, hey, I have a question. Why do they, yeah. why do you guys think they use dot product rather than cosine? They use what? Why do they use dot pro, dot product rather than cosine similarity? No, they measure? didn't. They're no, they didn't give me, No, they didn't even use the cosine or dot product. They use something called uh, dot product. Hey, no, not no, 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 no. Phase, uh, phase. That's that's just an index. Ah, uh, that's a method for making it easy to search oh. uh, mm -hmm. for similarity documents quickly. 
Mm -hmm. okay? okay. So that's, that's like a, uh, but the actual similarity measure you use is separate from phase. And I was wondering if, if you guys know why they use dot product versus cosine similarity when you're querying the phase index. Mm, yeah. So I think it's based on uh, flavor. Um, so because um, this is performed over the uh, okay over the search. Um, I think maybe this is something cool that maybe one can try different approach. Even though here yeah, they say that we, yeah we no no have... it's true it's true that's yeah. why I asked the question. I just thought someone on the call might be able to yeah. answer. I have a no. little bit of an idea, but why? Do you, okay. When do you use dot product versus when do you use cosine? Ah, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Mayan, do you have an answer or something like that? No, not here. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. So yeah, so here they use this stuff, you know, to do the um perform the nearest neighbor lookup by you know great get nearest example here um to do the lookup um using uh you know the key which is basically the number of uh uh, neighbors here they want to use and uh, yeah so this is um the second stage we can see here now this is exactly what we have the three retrieve document that we get via embedding lookup all have the same level so we can see like here new model we can see new model we can see um another one the three that we extracted new model so we um search for the embedding space and now we return three and they have the new model uh all very similar so the final step is aggregate the levels to the nearest neighbor to get the prediction so we can see here now uh, aggregate the level of the nearest neighbor to get a prediction right um so this is <laughs> i didn't run this stuff just trying to go through them. Uh, so here, finally, they aggregate the level of the nearest neighbor. Uh, the question remains, however, what is the best value for K? Um, so what they said here is that um, when they want to aggregate, um, you know, we have top K whatsoever, how many, what top K, how many are we going to choose to make sure um because here you can see how many k we have three nearest neighbor which is k so how many k do we need to have an optimal stuff so you can see like here they said uh, however what is the best value for k how should we get a level should we for example retrieve three document and assign the level so uh let us try they said uh, several value for k here they implemented a method here to find the best k and now here i think um they find the K and M here, looking at it here. And they find that uh, choosing uh, M too large or small for a given K is suboptimal result. So the best is achieved using a ratio of approximately M over K, um, which is they have here, find the M over K, which is like the K is 15 here. And, uh, M is five. So this is one thing they shows. Um, yeah, I didn't run this stuff and just read it. Um, okay. So now we have the method for finding the best value for embedding lookup. We can play the same game with name bias. So here, the same we use for name bias in the uh, uh, previous chapter. Uh, we know um, we float this with the data argumentation we saw. So here with this one also, they gonna use the same thing. And now we can see the performance here. So we can see like this is um, embeddings, right? Um, we can see the name base argumentation and the embedding here. So we can see now the embedding. Um, so how is it doing now the embedding? Okay, the embedding is not that better than name base and argumentation, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the embedding, I think, is not doing much better. So the embedding lookup is competitive on the micro scores. Yeah, it's competitive, we can see in micro, uh, with the previous approach while just having two learnable parameters, K and M. So yeah, of course, because he have, the embedding has two learnable parameters, but performs slightly worse on macro score. Um, so yeah. Um, they talk about uh, which um, method works best. They basically talk about it depends on the domain you are working on. 
So the, the domain, when you are doing zero shot, um, what matters is which domain you are working on. If you are using uh, similar domain, and then you can have a better performance. All right, anybody want to add something? Because you can see here, the zero shot pipeline we created here, the data is quite different from our data set for GitHub issue, right? Um, which contains a lot of code and, you know, may likely not have seen why doing pre-training, but for common tags such as sentiment analysis, the pipeline works much better. So it can, you know, so it depends on the tax you have. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, so this one is a uh, uh, fine tuning vanilla uh, transformer. So uh, uh, and this one also I haven't run it. Um, so, okay, do we have more time? Oh, okay, we have few time, few minutes. So this is fine tuning a vanilla transformer uh, where you just, you know, uh, if you don't have a level training data, uh, you have a few training data, you just fine tune a uh, print train model. This is using the BAT model. We already know this. And now um, you can do just, um, you know, fine tuning. And you can see we this is the performance of the fine tuning model. Um, yeah, Ooh, the fine tuning is, yeah. So we can see here now the fine tuning, you know, beat all the scenarios, uh, um, fine tuning the model. So what do you think, why fine tuning here is having, you know, beta performance, anyone with idea? Why fine tuning? Just normal. Um, Transform, the transformers architecture okay. is very set, is very set. <laughs> It's very sensitive <laughs> yeah, to okay. the context, and you can really uh -huh. influence it. Okay, so, good uh, one. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think. What's that? Go My, on. Yeah, I'm I think my. Yeah, I said yeah. Uh, you're on the right right track. Uh, uh, the transformers architecture exposes the fine fine tuning as. Uh, better alternative as compared to other approaches and yeah. uh, as we see with the amount of training samples it increases so yeah it, exactly uh, exactly yeah, yeah. exactly i'd say i'd say the whole moral of this chapter is you know just shut up and label 200 documents <laughs> don't be a baby <laughs> And then, and then, and then they do data augmentation right so shut up label data augmentation <laughs> That's the whole. Yeah. That's the whole thing. I don't know if I got anything, I I got yeah, anything yeah. more out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. Got you. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Um, they also discuss something in context. Uh, let me add one thing to that, though. I, if I'm because I'm GPT three insane, right? So okay. If I had to label two hundred, I would actually mm -hmm. write a prompt and try to get it to label it for me. Ah. And then I would as a semi-automated process, and then I uh -huh. go through. And review ah. those labels. Actually, ah. absolutely, I would do that for sure. Ah. It, would be, make, it makes it really easy and ah. quick to label a couple. So hundred. yeah, so it's somehow supervised leveling, right? Supervised learning, I call yeah. it maybe weak, weak supervised. Weak supervised. I mean, yeah, weak supervised. Yeah. <laughs> but weak supervised for without doing yeah. any coding. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, weak supervised. Yeah, yeah, weak supervised. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. Um, Exactly. So, for example, one um, thing we did like for weeks supervised is like um, we want to do sentiment analysis. So we grab all tweet with happy emoji as we supervise with just like they add a positive and something like that. So yeah. instead of doing the model. Yeah. 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 So so you do a few shot, you know, especially yeah. work for this one, because you only have so many topics, it's a small mm -hmm. number of topics, right? Yeah. Like 10, I think. I don't remember. <laughs> so in so you could actually, yeah, you could do a few shot and get pretty good. Yeah. Good stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, um, I, I in context and few short learning with prompts. Oh, it is okay. This is what you are talking about, um, uh, Darren, right? I'm not sure. I can't remember anymore. This part, um, but maybe. <laughs> uh, in context and few short learning with prompts. I think this is what because I even look at it. I think this is what you are just talking about. Maybe in context and few short learning with prompts. This, yeah. Then finally, the chapter discuss about leveraging or level data. So, um, or level data is not worthless. Yeah, we can do so. Um, Pre-training or model have used. Um, you know, uh, previously we had just used pre-training, 
and now we can basically um uh, even though they are trained on mostly or related data for the internet, we can leverage the pre-trained weights. And this is a core idea of, uh, you know, transfer and, uh, and NLP we know. Uh, so yeah, we have how many minutes? Uh, okay, we are on top of the hour. So this is just fine tuning the language model. So if we have, you know, um, on-trained data, um, um, on level data. So what we can do if the data is so large, what we can do is like, you know, we fine tune the language model with that all level data. And now with that thing, after doing the uh, fine tuning, then we can do go extra and do the um, uh, the classification, which is this uh, fine tuning, a class fine tune a classifier finally. So we can see here, um, you know, after doing the um, fine tuning the language models uh they go now and uh fine tune a classifier and now turn a model and now uh have this wow so <laughs> fine tuning um of course because we fine tune it to the domain so for example i want to do um head speech detection and now i have a model part based model large language model with land many weights parameters now I want to do um, head speech detection. I have a large or lovely corpus for head speech detection. Now I can fine tune my my, my model, uh, the last layer whatsoever, you know, all those transfer line and stuff, you can fine tune it, train the model, and now you can use the to, um, annotated sample to, um, you know, classify, to do uh, classification. And we can see like this, I think this is the best approach, um, you know, that, uh, works on this so um anyone wants to add um you know why fine tuning is the best as well we also saw that because it's transformer based as well but also we do you know uh, domain adaptation which is you know fine tuning to do, to um you know um uh, train uh continue training on your domain data that is why it is better so that's why they said fine tuning domain adaptation because you do the previous one we saw is fine tuning vanilla transformer base that is you haven't done any domain adaptation you just you know fine tune the model so yeah um they also discussed some advanced method i didn't look at them so that's what i got um anyone wants to have something um i i was actually surprised uh, i i guess this is an example and they they wanted to show many methods but domain adaptation doesn't improve stuff here that much well what do you mean here doesn't improve uh, so so if you compare uh, do, uh dash uh, yellow line and uh, solid mm -hmm. purple line mm -hmm. which is fine tuning with the main adaptation mm -hmm. uh, uh i guess on, yeah i mean uh, on, the, 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 on the github data ah okay like, yeah it's somewhat better in some in some number of samples mm -hmm. but but not by much yeah, because, yeah, because exactly. It that, it, do you think that's because the particular domain doesn't need adaptation? It doesn't really help much because you know there's so much stuff on the internet. About. Yeah, but so. remember, we fine tune with the you know all level data we have. We separated in the first beginning. We have all level data, so we fine tune with those data set, and so it's the same data that we do the domain adaptation here, and we can see like at last with more many more level we can see like here of course he um this uh you know has better performance but uh of course at some point we can see even like the fine tuning normal vanilla outperform the domain adaptation but it's not that much i think uh here as well but yuri you're saying you would have expected the domain and the domain adaptation to have a whole larger effect that's what you're saying right you're like, in your experience uh, well, it should, yeah, it should. So I guess the either like uh, GitHub uh, was already incorporated somehow uh, into the original. Okay. Okay. Uh, by tuning. Uh, oh yeah, 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 exactly. Language training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or maybe it, was it not enough data? You think? Yuri? Yeah, like that's, that's the thing. Like they should have gone to, you know, double the data and see what performance is. Yeah, they got, You're, I think they got tired, you know, they're getting tired. Of them, right? Yeah, so remember the fine tune we use the vanilla one uses the one I think with the trend with Python with the data set of Python that with GitHub. So that's why I think I think they mentioned it in the book. 
yeah, somewhere else. Okay, cool. Um, so we are on top of the hour already. Um, thank you for joining. And uh, please, we have another chapter. I think the next one is uh, training uh, from scratch. If anyone is available, you can sign up um, for the next chapter. We have two more chapters um, now. Um, thank you for joining and see you all next week. All right, bye guys. Yeah, this bye. has been helpful. Thank you. Bye. Okay, thank you, guys.